It is just a huge honor today to be podcast interviewing my buddy Sheldon Crancher with ClearTPS.com. This is a very interesting story. Uh, with over 25 years of experience in healthcare, Sheldon Crancher has spent the last decade integrating Invisalign into practices globally. Sheldon has held positions that include Regional Development Manager and Director of Business Development for Align Technologies in the U.S. and Europe, and currently provides consulting services to Align Technology. In these highly specialized roles, Sheldon has had the unique opportunity to work with hundreds of practices in the U.S., Canada, U.K., Ireland, and across Europe. Sheldon has a true passion and proven track record of success with the Visalign practice integration. In 2012, Sheldon co-founded Clear Treatment Planning Solutions, clearTPS.com, and in 2014, co-founded Clear Marketing Solutions. Sheldon lives with his wife and three children in Friendswood, Texas, and enjoys traveling and starting new business ventures in the dental profession. Where is Friendswood? So Friendswood is just south of Houston proper, Houston downtown, and just north of Galveston, uh, of course, on the on the Gulf Coast. So we're pretty close to the water. So tell us your story. How did you get? How did you uh, leave high school? 25 years ago and end up in dentistry out of all the professions on earth why are you not a plumber or an electrician how, how did you end up in dentistry you know it's really an interesting story howard uh you know out of high school my first real job i ended up working in the mailroom at cigna healthcare and of all things i uh basically handled dental claims and what year was I that guess, that was in 1988 Wow, 1988, you got a job at Cigna. I did, I did. And I, I worked for them for about eight years and uh, in various capacities. I was a benefit analyst and, you know, really saw the side of healthcare, uh, you know, from a, from a managed care perspective and then moved on to customer service. And then kind of fast forward in 1995 or so, I started working at UCLA School of Dentistry. And so, uh, you know, really got involved in, in dentistry from a continuing education perspective where I had exclusive responsibility for managing all of the uh, international dental study programs there at UCLA. And so, so you did eight years, eight years at Cigna and then how many years at UCLA? So I was there for five years, three years of which uh, was at UCLA itself and two years uh, was in Europe. Um, in, in the Netherlands, where I completed my undergraduate studies, uh, but I was also recruiting and promoting and marketing the international uh, CE programs at UCLA. We had a fairly large contingency in the European market, uh, worked very closely with the likes of uh, Sasha Jovanovic, um, a real progressive name in the implant world. We did a lot of perio and implant and aesthetic courses, and we recruited a lot of European dentists for that. So were you born in Amsterdam? No, I was born in California originally. My parents were born in Indonesia and then they immigrated to the Netherlands. But I have roots in the Netherlands and have lived there several times uh, throughout my life. And so now do you know why your mom moved from the Netherlands to California She and didn't yes. want to raise her children in the yes. red light district? <laughs> yes, that and, and the weather. <laughs> and the weather. Oh, I love Amsterdam. So what, what, do, what do you think of Amsterdam and their laissez-faire uh, lenient policies on all social issues? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's a very progressive, very, very um, um, liberal society, of course. Um, but I think the history is interesting, you know, from, uh, you know, from, that, from that same point of view, very, very inclusive. I think very progressive in, in many regards. I think they, they remain one of the most uh, economically stable and sound countries in the world today in the, in the dynamic, you know, globalized world that we live in. Uh, so I think they've, they've done some things right. I think certainly plenty of things are, are debatable and, uh, you know, seen maybe a little bit differently. But it's well, a great I, I prefer the Amsterdam model. I, I think all these vices are, are horrible in their own ways, but, you know, it's uh, locking people up and throwing away the, their life is not the answer to something that you don't agree with what they're doing, like smoking pot or prostitution or whatever i mean uh i i, I don't think it's very I, I think it's hard to reconcile being a doctor or a healer or someone who goes eight years of college to help their patients and then look at other problems and say oh the answer to that is to throw you away in a cage well yeah. that's that's there's got to be a better solution than criminalization sure. um so a lot so in my lifetime i got out of school 29 years ago 
And 29 years ago, most of the big brands, Colgate, Crest, Oral-B, Lister, they were all made. I would say the biggest brand made in dentistry in my 29 years was Invisalign. It went from non-existent. I mean, I've lectured in Indonesia, Malaysia, South Africa. I mean, everybody on the planet has heard of Invisalign. Yeah. I mean, you, you go you go to a restaurant in any country in the world, and the waitress finds out you're a dentist. Her first question is about Invisalign. Uh, th- 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 you got you got to give kudos to Invisalign. I mean, I don't care if you like their technology or not. You got to give their marketing an A plus plus plus. No one marketed better in dentistry than Invisalign in my lifetime. Absolutely agree, Howard, 100 percent. And that is, in fact, part of our platform. And we're very, very fortunate to have a very strong uh, working relationship with Align Technology. Of course, I spent eight years of my life working for them in the U.S. and in Europe. Uh, as well. And we have an ongoing uh, relationship with them. They're our largest client uh, and they endorse our, our services, frankly. And that's, uh, you know, I think a compliment to, to what we do and, and how we do it. But there's no question that the, the conversation that we have with our practices, with our clients, prospective clients, is what you just said, the, the enormity of the name of Invisalign. It is no doubt the best known dental and orthodontic brand in the world, period, nothing comes even close. And so the question becomes, how do we, how do we leverage that? How, do, how does a, a general dentist leverage that? How does an orthodontist leverage that brand awareness? You know, we talk a lot about co-branding with our practices in terms of, okay, you know, we understand that you want to brand your practice in a certain name, a certain way, whether it be a, a name, you know, a doctor's name, whatever, but, 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 how is it that we're missing the mark on leveraging such an incredible brand and brand name with Invisalign? A uh, huge, huge opportunity there for, for, for doctors and practices everywhere. Well, you know, dentists, you know, the natural selection to become a dentist or a physician or a lawyer is somebody who lives in a library. So when you go back to college, all your party animal friends didn't make the grades to become a dentist and a lawyer and a physician. So the people that end up being dentists, we're usually shy, introvert people who lived in a library, and they're the same personality as a physicist, an engineer. Um, and what I love about endodontics and Invisalign is dentists aren't good in cells. When I see the people that are crushing it in cosmetic rehabs and boob jobs and face and lifts and tummy tucks, they're charismatic people that can sell. Well, that's not my average homie. My average homie doesn't like to sell. I mean, in fact, he'll just tell, she'll tell you, I, I didn't go to school eight years to be a salesman. And what I love about Endo and Invisalign, with the, with the root canal, they're coming in and they're saying, Sheldon, I, I, I hurt, man. I, I can't sleep. I'm taking aspirin. Can you help me? And it's like, yeah, if you can do a root canal, sold. And they're coming in saying, yeah, I, I, you can't throw a cat on Facebook and not hear about Invisalign. I, I, I'd like to inquire about Invisalign. The problem is they all come out of school. They've never done one Invisalign case in school. So right yeah. now you're talking to a lot of kids. You said, Sheldon, I just graduated $350,000 in student loans. They didn't teach me one hour about ortho, let alone Invisalign. So let's start with baby steps. So we're on the first floor now. We want to walk up a stairway and eventually be on the second floor doing a lot of Invisalign. Start, yeah. what's stair one? How, how the hell do I learn how to do Invisalign? Yeah, it's an excellent point, Howard. And that's exactly how I ended up here. Uh, literally on day one in 2007, when I uh, first started working for Align Technology and, and selling Invisalign, of course, you know, there were certain things I, I knew with my background in, in dentistry and my background in, in medical, but there was a lot I didn't know and a lot to learn. But one thing that was very apparent literally on day one was the lack of experience, A, as you pointed out, and B, the lack of, of, of resources and support for what ends up being still a very, uh, very dynamic and very involved uh, treatment modality with, with Invisalign. And so on day one, I recognized that that was the biggest challenge that I had, that, that, our, that our doctors had. And then fast forward in 2011, when I had the incredible opportunity uh, to go uh, with Align Technology to Europe in, in an expanded role, I encountered the same exact challenge. And it was really on that premise that I said, you know what, there has to be a better way. There has to be a way that we can provide uh, a deeper level of, of, of support and resources. And so that was when we, we developed ClearTPS. Uh, we brought a, cl- a team of clinicians uh, together 
that provide these support services, these diagnostic case evaluation and treatment planning services to exactly uh, who you described. You know, the, the kid coming out of, uh, of, of uh, you know, their fourth year dental school or, or their AGD residency and they haven't treated a single case. You know, uh, we do see some dental schools, uh, University of Texas, San Antonio, for example, they've integrated Invisalign training into the fourth year uh, uh, a dental uh, program, which is which is great news. We need to see more of that. But even in that instance, even if they've put their hands on a couple of cases, there's still so much that they don't know. And that's where we pick up the pieces. We say, you know, is this a good Invisalign case? We'll, we'll let our team of experts help you identify the right case. Let, let our team of orthodontists and general dentists help you diagnose this Invisalign, this or orthodontic case properly. And better yet, we're going to manage this, this digital treatment plan, this ClinCheck treatment plan for you in such a way that it's going to be optimized that you can actually get the result that you want. So that's kind of my, my short or, or long answer to that, that question. So how long have you been working in Invisalign? A total of eight years. So, 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 this, so after eight years in Invisalign, you saw a need for uh, a, a cons an Invisalign consulting company that consults both clinical and marketing. Correct. So Correct. if I so my homies go to uh, Clear TPS, which stands for Clear Treatment Planning Solutions. Clear Treatment Planning Solutions dot com, which I'm there now on my iPhone. What are they going to find? So they're going to find a couple things. They're going to find uh, clinical support first and foremost. They will also find uh, some uh, resources. Uh, for uh, Invisalign marketing as well. So those are kind of our, our staples. Uh, a third, of course, is I do uh, Invisalign practice integration consulting, uh, of course, more on, on a local basis. Uh, but those are the three pillars, if you will, of, of what we do uh, to help doctors fully integrate Invisalign into practice. And um, if someone's sitting there thinking, so, so give your pitch on, on – uh clear aligners because they're, they're coming out of school and they're saying, um, well, you know, there's so many things to learn. I, I, I can't learn them all. I could go learn a TMJ or, or occlusion at, uh, the Pank Institute, Koi, Spear. Um, I could, uh, go learn how to place implants, um, and bone graft. I could learn sleep apnea. I could learn Invisalign and they, they can't learn it all. And they only have so much time and money. What, what, what's the pitch for Invisalign? I mean, what, what, what is reasonably expected? If I've never done an Invisalign case and yeah. I do your program like a year from now, how, what kind of material impact would this have in my office? Should I expect it to be doing one case a month, one yeah. case a week? What, what, what's, what's realistic? Yeah, it's a good question, Howard. Let me start uh, at the beginning. First of all, I would encourage these doctors, young uh, just coming out of school, you know, five years out of school, 10 years out of school, whatever the case may be, to, to first of all, you know, really focus on, on what moves you, right? To really focus on, on the types of procedures that you enjoy doing. You know, dentistry is a really, really tough job. We know that. So really focus on what moves you, what interests you. That's first and foremost. But also look at the fact that, that really, in, in my opinion, of course, I'm looking at these things from a commercial perspective. Uh, and marketing perspective and from a business perspective. I would argue that that dentists are, are business owners, small business owners, even before they're dentists. Now, granted, they, they come out of you know dental school as, as dentists or residency, what have you. But you know, as soon as they uh, turn on the lights at the practice, they're they're a small business owner. And so so alongside of, of, of pursuing what moves you, I think equally if not more important is understanding fundamentally what is going to A, drive patients to the practice, and B, really turn practice from a production and collections perspective uh, and, and from a bottom line perspective. And Invisalign facilitates exactly that. And it doesn't mean that you can't do you know, everything else that you do or everything else that you need to do in the practice or for that matter, the things that you like to do. And so to put it into perspective, you know, um, we believe that and, and with the practices that I've worked with at absolute minimum, at absolute minimum, there should be anywhere from four to six cases a month minimum. And if you look at the, the, the average number of patients just coming through hygiene in an average practice, call it 150 to 200 
uh, invisible or uh, hygiene patients coming through hygiene. You're familiar with the statistics, you know, anywhere from 75 upwards to 85 or even 90 percent of patients have some form of malocclusion. So the numbers are there. So, so first, it's kind of painting that picture saying the opportunities are there. How do we get one to three percent of your patient base started with Invisalign? Now, if we do that, if we do that consistently and effectively, you're looking at anywhere from two to three hundred thousand in production just in a year. That's our whole <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Invisalign can pay off your student loans. Absolutely, 100%. If they did four to six cases a month. Mm-hmm. Four to six cases a month. Now, let me just take the opportunity to put that into perspective. That's the average practice. There are practices, Howard, that we work with, that we provide clinical support services to in London, of all places. And, of course, certainly you can argue, well, they have you know really, really messed up teeth, and they absolutely do. But we have practices in London that do 90 Invisalign cases every single month. 90, nine, zero. And that's a few more than four a month. We're talking about 90. So the potential is there. Just if we, even with existing patient database, not to mention new patients that are coming in. And then of course, what better way to bring new patients in than leveraging Invisalign like what we talked about. But you know what? <clears throat> When you're dealing with humans, you want to under-promise, over-deliver. Like, I see dentists all the time, like, after a root canal, the patient will say, is this going to hurt? And they're like, no, no, you'll be fine. It's like, what the hell do you want to say that for? You should under-promise. You should say, my God, do you have a gun at home? Because when this wears off, you're probably going to want to shoot yourself. And they're like, oh, my God. You know, start taking aspirin, ibuprofen, Tylenol right now. I'm going to give you one while you're still numb. I mean, when this wears off, oh, my God. I hope you're not standing on a bridge because you'll probably want to jump off head first. You want to mm-hmm. under-promise, over-deliver. Every time I pull a tooth, I show that attractive to the patient and say, look at the hook on the end of that root. That thing was twisted back under your cheekbone, damn near into your eye. I swear to God, when this wears off, you're probably going to want to shoot yourself in the head. And, and, and so what I like to tell dentists is that, you know, if you go into Invisalign or you go into implants, whatever, you should aim for Your goal should be one a month. I mean, one a week. You know, mm-hmm. if you don't learn him, if you're going to spend all that money on implants and you can't place one a week, then don't do it. And mm-hmm. if you're going to do all this Invisalign thing, you should aim for one a week. And Great. if you can't do one a week, don't do it. And and I also see dentists as two types. There's the uh, the apical, there's the blood and gut barbarians who love implants, endo, oral surgery. They just love blood and guts. That's me. And then there's the clean teeth lovers who like ortho, Invisalign, sleep apnea, bleaching, bonding, veneers. And I also see a lot of the younger blood and guts guys, when they start getting, you know, 50 and they can't see very good and their hands aren't as good and they don't know what's going on. They like to switch out from blood and guts into lean and clean and mean stuff like Invisalign, uh, you know, um, sleep apnea, bleaching, bonding, veneers. How do you think that breaks down, uh, Howard, in terms of percentage, percentage of, of blood and guts versus percentage uh, in terms of doctor, number of percentage of doctors who fall in, in each one of those categories? I'd say, I'd say it's the 80-20 world. 80% like the clean stuff, bleaching, okay. bonding, yeah. veneers, and 20% yeah. just, I mean, for me, it's not even fun unless when I'm done and when I go to wash my hands, I see little pieces of blood on my, my bald head. I mean, that's when I know I was having fun. Is there, <laughs> damn, there's blood actually on my head. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I think the most fun thing in the world is to remove four wisdom teeth. There's just nothing more fun than that. Um, but but a lot of people love the the clean stuff, the ortho, the Invisalign. I want to ask you another. So so back to the clinical. She's she's driving down the street. She's 25. How is she going to learn the clinical? How is she going to learn this? I mean, most dentists will tell you they don't want to do anything until they get an A in the diagnosis and treatment planning and doing. They don't want to get yeah. an A in the marketing and have a bunch of patients show up sure. and they're like, what the hell's wrong with this? What's sure. going on? Yeah, it's a great question, Howard. And I want to relate the question back to what you said a minute ago in terms of this idea of, hey, unless you're going to do, you know, one case a week, you know, it's really not worth doing it. But I think it's important to understand and ask the question, hey, doc, you know, or hey, docs, what's keeping you from doing one a week? And it might be exactly what you said in terms of that confidence. In fact, we know that to be true based on what Align Technology has identified over and over for the past decade or better, that the number one reason why doctors don't submit more Invisalign cases is simply clinical confidence, which 
again, it's why we exist. It's, 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 it's what we address up front. Now, we know that uh, a day-long course, which I think is soon to be a half-day course, and it might even eventually end up on an online course for, for on Invisalign. Dental town. On Dental Town. Hey, let's do it. <laughs> you know, we don't even have an Invisalign course. You know, we put up 350 courses on Dental Town, and they've been viewed 750,000 times. It's incredible. It'd be the best marketing ClearTPS.com could do. You should do a teaser one-hour course on Invisalign marketing for your office and then do another clinical how, how to do Invisalign. And then at the end, if you want more, go to ClearTPS.com. It, it'd be the single best marketing you could do. I like it. I like it. No, it's a great idea. And, and as just to, to, to further the, the answer to your question, you know, the 25-year-old, you know, driving down the street that, that you just described, what we're able to do is support that doctor from beginning to end. I mean, we've got doctors that we've been supporting for the last uh, almost five years. They literally will submit every single Invisalign case over to us. Uh, we will hold their hand. We will answer their questions. We will help them diagnose, identify the right cases. We will help them troubleshoot if a case isn't tracking or if the patient hasn't been compliant. And literally for that 25-year-old dentist, we can, we can hold their hand from the beginning all the way and they can go as deep as they want we can say hey you know what that's a really complex case it's going to require auxiliaries and elastics you know or or do you want or, or, or ask the question you know do you want to correct that 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 posterior you know class two you know malocclusion or 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 is it stable and and we can really really get into a dialogue and provide that support all the way um you know when you look at the nine specialties um, this is changing orthodontics, isn't it? Orthodontists. How, how, how do you view the changing dynamics of the orthodontic market? Because you could call this a disruptive technology. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and it was, you know, back in 1998 when, uh, when two Stanford students, you know, one computer scientist and one, you know, one MBA, you know, realized that, uh, you know, if you, if you left your retainer out for a couple of days, your teeth would move. But then when you put it back in, that they'd move back to where they were. And, and, and that's really where that whole idea started. And so uh, early on, the, the, the primary target was orthodontists. And what we saw happen and still happen today, uh, Howard, I think very unfortunately, th there's still a slow rate of adoption among orthodontists. Uh, with Invisalign or aligner therapy in general, and what that has done is that has created this 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 <laughs> huge uh, space and opportunity and and interest among among GPs. And now, 15, 17 years later, you know the orthos are finding themselves in a little bit of an uncomfortable situation as it relates to you know the percentage, the growing percentage of orthodontic starts in general, even outside of Invisalign, that are happening in the GP practice. It used to be uh, 75%, it's probably 80% of total orthodontic starts are uh, coming from the GP practice. And I think aligner therapy has had, had a lot to do with it, including the likes of Six Month Smile and, and, you know, and, and other solutions like that. But I think it's changing it in some very unique ways um, in the sense of how orthodontists are interacting with their uh, perhaps formerly referring GPs. You know, I think that's so something that, that needs to, uh, you know, be discussed in, in terms of, because I have these conversations with orthodontists all the time. I'm not getting referrals from my GPs. You know, GPs who used to refer, uh, you know, they, they must be doing it themselves. So they must be doing uh, Invisalign. And I think in, in a lot of instances, that's, that's the case. Now, I think there's also the case that you've got certain orthodontists who have anticipated this, this interesting dynamic that we're seeing, and they have engaged their GPs in a much different way. They do study clubs in their practice, and I'm sure you're familiar with this. They do hygiene study clubs. Uh, they are quick to, to pick up the phone or call the doctor back and actually help them on a case and really empower them in a way that, you know, when the GP invariably comes across a case that they just don't really want to treat, then guess where it's going? It's going to that doctor that supported them. And, it, and that's what I'm telling these young kids when they come out of school. So you go set up in a city. So half the doctors will think, half the specialists will think in fear and scarcity. And they don't want you to learn anything that'll take 
money away from them, and the other half thinking hope, growth, and abundancy. And there are and there are periodonists that if you just why would you need to learn a soft tissue management course or learn any of this stuff when there is one periodontist in your county thinks in hope and growth and abundancy, and you say, hey, will you come in my office and set up the the periodontal program with me and my hygienist? And they'll say, absolutely. They'll bring Subway sandwiches and set all up because they want you to do all the soft tissue management because when you get to something you can't do, they're going to get your business. I see the same thing with orthodontists. These other orthodontists make everybody afraid that if they find out I'm doing an Invisalign, he's not going to like me and I have to sit next to him at the study club and the Kiwanis club and, and I, I'm in the closet that I'm doing short-term ortho. And then there's other orthodontists say, oh, man, that's awesome. Hey, come by my office. I'll put yeah. together a study club. And if, you need, and if you get to a case... That you, I mean, obviously, you can't treat every single case, so there, there would be a specialist. I mean, look, look at endodontists. Those endodontists will help you learn endo because they know you're going to do all the one canals. They weren't born under a rock, but obviously, there's going to be a lot of molars that you don't want to do. So they'll teach you every endodontic thing they know because they know that they'd rather have a percent of something than 100% of nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's that's descriptive and characteristic of this, this inherent – fear in the profession as well. And I think it's even more obvious and apparent in uh, you know, from, in terms of specialties with orthodontics. I mean, we talk about it all the time. And I have firsthand experience having worked in a dental school environment, working with all the sections. I mean, we dealt with, with, with every specialty, but it was always obvious to me. And, and in retrospect, looking back, you know, I remember the, the, the secret password and the secret handshake that I had to do before I went and, and to talk to the, the, the section chair of orthodontics. And I didn't know what that was about. Of course, I'm kidding. But but I think it, 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 it makes the point that it's, it's so isolated and that's kind of where it all starts. And whether or not that will change, I, I don't know. But but I well, think, you know. Well, I, I, got, I got even more proof. Not only was that true when I was in dental school, but when we started Dental Town, all Eight of the nine specialties just got on Dental Town and shared everything they knew. And one group said, never, never, give us our own site. And, and I, I held out, said, no, come come talk to all your referring doctors. No. And that was Orthotown, and you can't get on there unless you're an orthodontist. So mm -hmm. the, the CEO of Invisalign couldn't get on Orthotown. I can't get on Orthotown, and I own the damn website. Uh, ah. So, uh, you know, so it, 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 it's a cultural change. And it just goes from living in fear to living in hope. But I want, I want to clarify one thing. When sure. I said, you know, when I say to these kids, if you're going to learn implants, don't get into it unless you're going to do one per week. If you're going to learn Invisalign, don't get into it unless you do one per week. And it's not so much the return on investment of all the time and money. It's the fact that I, you know, the, the clarity issue when you're talking to specialists or whatever, the, the clarity defining answer is what is the best for the patient? And yeah. you work back from that. And I yeah. personally believe that um, it, on, for a doctor, if you're not doing one per week, I don't really know if the patient should be seeing you. I mean, I've had I've had one surgery, right, a vasectomy. I wouldn't want to go get that done by some guy who did one case a year and then say <laughs> to me, hey, I think I cut the nerve instead of the vas deferens. Um, you know, I, 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 think, I think one per week is that critical deal. It also explains dentures. When I go into a dental office and this dentist has a filling and a crown, and, uh, you know, a couple of procedures and he's doing them every week. He's really, really good. But then the, then a denture will come in and he only, and he only does one every six months. He doesn't make good dentures. Yeah. You know, you really don't get really good at something and yeah. you should do it at least once a week for a really long time. And I yeah, think and that's, that's really the definition of, of an expert because, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't think you can say that you're the best person for this job for my patient. If you do some, if you do this every six months, yeah, there's no, got to be someone point. in the County that does it more often than yeah. twice a year. And that's an excellent point, Howard. It makes me think about Malcolm Gladwell's uh, book uh, outliers and 10,000 hours. And that certainly applies, but I think it's fundamentally important to go back and try to understand what is keeping these doctors from doing more than one implant a week or one Invisalign case a week. And that's again, where we come in. And I think giving them that confidence. In addition, I will challenge this, the, 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 the idea that, uh, you know, you wouldn't want to go, or so I certainly would agree that you wouldn't want to go to any, any physician or, or doctor or, or dentist, if they're doing less than, than one a week on any procedure, unless, unless, 
they had a team of experts that they partnered with that they have literally a straight line to, whether it be by email or phone call. And in fact, one of our doctors here locally uh, in Houston, Texas, Dr. Amanda Canto, uh, the way oh, she- I love her. Isn't she great? Oh my God, she's the coolest dentist in the world. She's very cool. I mean, out of two million dentists around the world, who is cooler <laughs> than Amanda Cantos? No, Amanda Cantos very, very cool, and she is an exclusive user of Clear TPS. And this is what she says to her patients: She says, "You know, look, Mister Patient, I tell you what, we're gonna we're gonna assess your case. We're gonna we're, we're gonna um, we're, I'm gonna have a discussion with with my clinical team, which is our clinical team, Clear TPS." And we're going to have a conversation about your treatment and your treatment plan. We're going to see if you're a suitable candidate for Invisalign. She takes those photos. She uploads them to her Invisalign doctor site. She sends them over to us. In two business days, we turn around with a summary, an explanation, a diagnosis, expectation, approximate treatment time. And Dr. Dr. Canto gets to confidently go back to that patient and say, hey, Mr. Patient, I got some fantastic news for you. Uh, the me and the clinical team that came back with a with a very positive uh, response. You're a fantastic candidate. Um, we're going to go ahead and um, uh, move forward with records, and that's a close right there. It's 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 really not that hard. It's almost easy. And she is a uh, a phenomenal role model. I she, mean, I mean, uh, she's uh, her website's what HoustonDental.com. I, I think it's Houston HoustonDental.com. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. Uh, you. Uh, um, we're 10 days out from Christmas, and so my Christmas present to me from Sheldon Crancher is you're going to call Amanda Cantos and tell her, I've been dying to get her on my podcast show for two years okay. and guilt her out because um, when I was in <laughs> dental school, the senior class had one woman. And now these dental schools are half women, and they don't like it when all the role models and, and instructors are all a bunch of fat, white, bald, cracker males they 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 want to see they want to see women role models and they they tell me that yeah. and i get emails on that and if i can't, if i was a young 25 year old dentist female that just walked out of school i couldn't think of a greater role model than amanda could you not not at all so she's you call incredible. her up you say you get on howard's show i promised i promised him that for christmas okay. i will i promise um you know you know another thing you remind me of so much is the same thing with implant success the, the dentists are always trying to save a nickel, so they buy their implants online from Russia or Israel or some other company, and they get these low-cost implants, but nobody's holding their hand. Yeah. And then when I see the dentists that are placing an implant a month, the one only one thing they all have in common is they're buying from a local rep, so it's a big brand name like Noble BioCare, so they're paying twice as much for their implants. But they got someone with your smiley face, your expert knowledge, you seeing the best practices of hundreds of dentists, and he's just living in his own little world. And the people that are holding hands, that's the other reason I don't think um, Amazon is going to uh, take off with dental supplies. For the same reason Dental Town didn't sell dental supplies uh, when we started in 1998. You know, when I started Dental Town, uh, there were 20 other websites but they were all going to sell supplies. And I was the one that said, who cares? I'm going to build a community because when you look at a dental office, 35% goes to the doctor, 28% goes to the staff, 10% goes to the lab, only 6% is supplies. And that dentist doesn't care about that 6% for one major region. When that supply rep is in there from Benco or Burkhardt or Shine or Patterson or whatever, it, it's not the... I have a question on the gauze or the anesthetic or the, the price of lidocaine. It's, hey, oh. <laughs> hey, I hear this wave one endophiles out. Do any endodontists in my, in my town use wave one? And she's like, oh, well, you should talk to the endodontist over here. Talk, talk to Brad Gettleman. Or, or you say, well, what about this? I mean, it's, it's the community. And yeah. for so many shy, introvert, geek dentists, that supply lady is the yeah. link to the community. That's why they yeah. join a study club. Um, yeah. That's why um, they would rather buy implants from a human being with a smiling yeah. face like you that can say, you know what, I'm a little nervous about this because on this particular case, I'm going to have to do a sinus lip and I'm thinking, should I do a flap or should I do a sinus bump? And they go, you know who you need to talk to? You need to go have lunch with Dr. So-and-so. He's on the other side of town. You'll love yeah. him. He'll help you. You know, it's yeah. a community. That's what Dental Town is. Right? Dental Town doesn't sell really anything. I mean, the classified yeah. ads are free. Almost everything's free, but they log on there every day 
Because yeah. everyone they love, their mom, dad, wife, kids, everyone that loves them can't yeah. really help them during a root canal. Yeah. And so yeah. they just long for a community of like-minded people who have the same damn problem. So my advice to you is if you're going to start placing implants, find out which rep in your town you have chemistry with. And if you're yeah. going to try to do Invisalign, just look at Sheldon's smiling face and tell me <laughs> that you don't want to network with this homie. And, and it's, it's the truth. I mean, I don't know that there's anyone uh, as passionate as I am about uh, Invisalign integration, as you had mentioned in, in my well, bio. Amanda, Amanda's more. I'm, I'm going to call, and call, and maybe I'm Amanda gonna call Monty tell. on that. I'm calling <laughs> bullshit right out of the gate. It's Amanda. And, and, and I'm going to share a story with you that you'll appreciate. So when I was in Europe with the line, one of the most amazing, most one of the most rewarding professional experience and, and personal experiences of my entire life. I was on uh, the European leadership team with the managing director, all the all the directors, uh, clinical uh, marketing sales, and and towards the end of that that period of time, there was a, a team building event, and the team building event I was not a part of because I was in the process of transitioning back to the U.S. I heard this story afterwards and they one of the exercises they had was they split into two teams and the exercise was to identify the one person that if they could go to the moon to sell Invisalign, who would that person be? So after 15, 20 minutes of deliberation, the two groups came back and they picked the same person, Howard. And who was that person? It was Sheldon they, Crancher. Yeah, they picked me to go to the moon to sell Invisalign. That is, uh, that is, uh, that is very cool. You know, and it's, 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 um, it, I just, I think I have a, a very clear vision and understanding of how it all works. And I'm just dying to, to, to package it up and give it to every single doctor out there that is open and willing to receiving that. And that's, that's, that's who we are. When you go to work all day and it's really tough and it's hard, it's called stress. But when you go to work all day and it's really tough and it's really hard and you love it, it's called passion. And the yeah. passionate dentists do so much better than the stressed out dentists. And it's all because of your attitude. Yeah. I mean, you just got to get passionate. Where, where do you think your passion comes from? You think your mom and dad instilled that into you? You think your you mom know, dropped you when you were a little kid? You um, know, I'm <laughs> sure she dropped me a couple times. Howard, there's no question about that. Honestly, I think it comes from a couple places. You know, my parents being immigrants, as I had mentioned before, I think there's a, a certain element there. But I think, you know, the, the work ethic is something that I got from my father who, uh, you know, literally before we did anything on, on Saturday, we had to, to, you know, cut the grass and, and rake the leaves and then and, and pick weeds. And that was that was in parallel to, you know, having a paper route. And this is at the ripe age of, of, of eight years old. And so I think that's really kind of where it comes from. And then really, uh, you know, just having travel and the world and, and, and ha having experienced so many different people and cultures in, in different places. And then having seen dentistry in so many different places, Howard, I mean, it's like, I mean, I've seen dentistry, you know, first when I was at, at UCLA school of dentistry, it was, it was incredible to receive these, these doctors, these passionate doctors, by the way, from Korea, from Taiwan, uh, you know, India, and I mean, from all these places in South America and to, to, to interact with them and to see their passion to come to America and to come to UCLA, this this amazing uh, educational institution. And then to see, you know, something very similar when I was in Europe working with doctors and dentists and to see that they all have, they should all share the same challenges, Howard. They all have, you know, that, 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 that stressful environment that they, that they work with. And I think our gift or my gift to these doctors is, hey, how can we make your life easier? How can, how, how, can, how can we make the profession that you've committed yourself to something that you really enjoy? You know, I want to switch gears completely and talk about a whole different topic, patient financing. Um, I, I just want to rant about a couple of things. I mean, in, uh, in the United States, if you buy something over $1,000, 90% of the time it's bought on installment credit. No, yes, only 10% of the people walk in and plop down $30,000 for a car. The other 90% get financing and pay $500 a month for 36 months. Um, when we go back through history, everybody talks about how famous the Model T was, but they don't finish the story. The Model T, the assembly line was closed down because General Motors started a Chevy, and with the Model T, you had to show up and give them $668. 
and General Motors started GMAC financing and said, hey, come over here, poor broke farmer. You only have yeah. to pay us $49 a month for 36 yeah. months, and GMAC was better than Ford, and they closed that line. Another story, me being Irish descendants. In 1950, when a million Irish came over here, all the jobs were textile mills. But you couldn't get a job unless you owned a $50 sewing machine. And there were like 80 different sewing machines that were amazing that you could buy. But it was one man from London called Singer who said, these Irish blokes don't have 50 bucks. So I'm going to sell them a Singer sewing machine. And if I give them a machine, they can get a job for three bucks a week. And they're going to get paid and give me a dollar a week. And he was the only sewing machine that said, give me a dollar a week, and you can have that sewing machine today. And guess where all the Irish went? To Singer. And guess where all of our grandparents, guess which sewing machine they had? Singer. Singer. And they don't even, re and all the other ones went under, just like Henry Ford's Model T assembly line closed down because of installment credit. So Invisalign is a major purchase. You just can't go tell an American, hand me 5,000 bucks. I mean, if you ask for 5,000, you might as well ask for 50 million. So yeah. how does patient financing play into the successful closing of the Invisalign case? Yeah, it's 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 critical, uh, Howard. And really, what you've described is, you know, characteristic of, of the entire profession, and, and really applies to almost almost every other procedure that they do. That's over a thousand dollars, whether it's implant, whether it's a restorative case, uh, aesthetic case, but specifically with Invisalign. And I think that's part of the the the, the challenge that that I think the profession has is that it's by far, in my view, patient financing is the most powerful closing tool, yet the most underutilized. And it goes back to the fundamental fact, and not unlike what you said about uh, about dentists and, and their difficulty in, in this idea of selling and selling treatment, it's, it's just a really difficult thing for, do, for them to do. The, the same is true for the people that are in their practice that are presenting treatment plans. And, and that's where we focused a lot of our consulting uh, and, and training is really looking at that particular piece because if we can if we can fix that piece or, or not even fix it but improve it slightly <laughs> the entire dynamic of, of the practice specific to Invisalign as you point out it's a relatively high um, uh, ticket item as, as, as we refer to it as and it's really important to effectively leverage the patient patient financing options that are available because in effect now you're presenting a treatment plan and a treatment fee to say look you know we've got some fantastic news for you we can get you started on your Invisalign treatment for nothing down and payments for about you know $129 a month $129 a month absolutely that's a 60 month term and so if we're appealing to that 90% that you just talked about if we're appealing to that 90% that has a tendency to to, uh, to 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 go with a, a low monthly payment alternative, then why aren't we talking about that? Why why is every single treatment plan out there today, including Invisalign, presented in such a way that they're only appealing and addressing the ten percent and saying, okay, you have a treatment plan that's five thousand dollars. Now you've basically lost. The patient at that at that moment. Ninety percent of the time. Yeah, absolutely. And and so so there's a real opportunity to change the mindset and the mentality as it relates to patient financing. And to your point, I think it's inherent to the to the culture of the profession as well. Well, I don't want to pay you know the five percent fee. Okay. Well, with Invisalign, as it turns out, um, the likes of Care Credit, for example, they have a three and a half percent fee that no one knows about because. Care Credit's not out there promoting, you know, a, a point and a half discount for Invisalign. No one talks about it, but they have a specific code for three and a half percent. Now, the answer to the to the question of, hey, you know, I don't want to spend, you know, the five percent. Well, first of all, it's three and a half percent, which is only about, you know, one and a half percent more than what you're paying when they're swiping the credit card. So, so to me, that argument is completely out the door. But I think more fundamentally, it's gaining the experience and the skills to effectively present treatment uh, and leveraging low monthly payments as, as a first option. Because when it's a last option, the last option certainly can't be the best one, right? So I think you know, in terms of patient psychology, let's offer what we believe to be the best option first at 129 a month, no out of pocket.
you know, and, and, and I think that describes uh, pretty much what's happening in every practice out there with some exceptions, some of the practices that we've worked with. Um, it um, reminds me, do, are you old enough to remember Orthodontic Centers of America? I, I am familiar with Orthodontic Centers of America. So it's a lost lesson that people uh, uh, need to remember. And that is, it was a good old Catholic boy out of Louisiana, uh, New Orleans. New Orleans huh? And um, what he realized is that why are, why are you financing orthodontics? It, it didn't make sense to him. I mean, um, you know, you incur the cost every time you come to the orthodontist every month for 24 months. When the orthodontist says, I need 1500 down, and then I'm going to finance a 3500 he, he said, well, that, that's like, what if, what if you went and got a haircut once a month? And the barber said, I'm going to sell you a 24-month package of getting haircuts, and I need one-third down, and I'm going to finance uh, the second third. You'd say, are you out of your mind? Nobody would do that for a Manny Petty or a haircut. Yet they didn't organize it. He said the Pano and Sef, that's a dollar each. The bracket's a hundred bucks. What what do you what do you need an economic barrier of a yeah. third down? And, and which was fifteen hundred dollars, which we've already said if it's over one thousand, ninety percent of Americans can't afford. So Orthodontic Centers was the first one that said, Hey, zero percent interest, zero down payment, one ninety nine a month. For 36 months, and you can have orthodontics at Orthodontic Centers of America. And no less than a million moms said, oh, my God, I don't have a $1,500 down payment. I'm going to Orthodontic Centers of America. And they are the only ones to date from a DSO that made it to the New York Stock Exchange and was publicly traded on the NYSE. And it was all about the financing. There wasn't one mom out there that said their orthodontists are better qualified. uh, They're closer and more convenient. Nobody said anything but one thing. Damn, there's no down payment. I can do that. And I asked orthodontists, I said, why do you charge a third down and finance the back half? Are you going to prepay your labor, supplies, lab, rent, mortgage, equipment, build out, computer, insurance, update? Are you going to prepay all that shit? They go, no. I said, then what do you do? And they go, because the diagnosis that's yeah. the hard work. And I say, okay, well, let me whip out the world's smallest violin and start playing you yeah. a pity party about, you know, that was all the work. Put the patient first. She ain't got a down payment. And if I was an orthodontist, I'd have a billboard out on the front road. Come uh, to me. Zero yeah. percent interest, zero percent financing. Nobody's, cr- no credit check necessary for yeah. just two forty nine a month. We'll do your ortho. And, and, and Orthodox Centers of America only had a 1% default rate. Why? Because yep. yep. your customers are all walking around with a bunch of brackets glued to their teeth. Yep. And yep. at some point, you're going to have to come back to say, hey, you glued a bunch of shit to my teeth. How, how do we get all this off? Exactly. No, you're, you're absolutely it's right. All, now. It's all financing. Yeah. And it's, it's another aspect that I'm very passionate about. And I've spent the last 10 years. I worked actually for... Um, Capital One Healthcare Finance, Dental Fee Plan, you might remember them. Yeah. Worked for them, sold for patient financing for them, and then went on to, to co-found a company called eMedical Lending, which was uh, a multi-lender platform concept. That was in 2006, and we ran that for a couple of years. And I also co-founded another patient financing in uh, in the UK when I was working with Align. So, so I'm very, very passionate about patient financing. What what appears to be happening now is there the, the market has been flooded with um, uh, with patient financing companies, and and it appears to be more of the same. And so they're they're really, I mean, they they're trying to differentiate themselves from each other, and and they're not really doing that. They're they're in the end, in the end, they're really all the same. Um, and 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 they're overlooking the the fundamental reason why patient financing isn't utilized at a higher level. Uh, and it's simply because at the practice level, they are incapable. In fact, I was speaking to um, one of our oral surgeons uh, a, a while back, uh, and he said it He said it best, and this is no offense to, to anybody, of course, but he says that, you know, in, in the dental practice environment, we put the most important task, that of presenting the financials, in oftentimes the least capable person, the person who may not have a college degree, may not have any sales or presentation experience. And I'm thinking to myself, that's completely true, but what's that all about? How do we how do we change that? Or, or how do these patient financing address that piece? You know, they're just trying to get their brochures into the practice and trying to get their doctors to, you know, doctors to sign up and, 
and submit loans, but 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 how do you get how do you support them? So so not unlike how do you hold their hand clinically with Invisalign to get them to actually submit that one case a week? What are patient financing companies doing to support their doctors in understanding the fundamentals of how to more effectively leverage this tool and how to more effectively present treatment fees to patients? That's not happening. Care Credit's not doing it. You know, um, you know. And, and and you have these these lenders that have come and gone to the market. Chase, they, you know, they they acquired to get in, into the space. They said, you know, let's let's take a crack at it. I don't think they approached it any differently. All these patient financing companies, who are, I think, who, who's Chase with now? So they they left the market. So Chase Health Advance left the market. Um, uh, you know, there's all these new players coming in, but to me, they're they're all the same. And and in my my vision. Uh, Howard for patient financing is to have a solution that that very closely um, uh, could be described in the way that you described what we know is the lowest default rate segment of, of healthcare uh, financing, and that is orthodontics. We know that that has the lowest default rate across the board. Dentistry, of course, is right in there. So dentistry and orthodontics are the lowest risk segments compared to plastic, vision, uh, you know, bariatric, you know, all these other segments have really, really high default rates. I'm looking for a patient financing company or one of the companies, or I, I want to eventually, you know, start my own to say, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to offer exactly what you described, 100% acceptance, you know, uh, uh, zero down, um, you know, interest-free for all these Invisalign uh, patients who, who we know that ends up being one of the biggest barriers in the end. So are you, um, are, is your religion Invisalign or are you agnostic? I mean, there's, there is basically the categories called what clear aligners. Yes. Clear aligners. And, and there a n- name, how many brands are there in the clear aligner business? You know, there's, I've kind of lost track, but, uh, I'm going to say probably in the neighborhood of, uh, north of, of, of 15 at this stage, there's, name, there's name some of the big ones. Yeah. So you've got Inman aligners, you've got, uh, MTM, uh, you've got red, white, and blue. You've got, of course, Clear Correct, uh, Invisalign, of course, the biggest. But, but I will say, and, and the answer to your question is, none of those Clear Aligner solutions even remotely compare to Invisalign uh, in, 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 in a few ways. Number one, from a technology perspective, Invisalign is so far ahead from a technology perspective. These other companies that I mentioned and, and others really – sit in a different category, and that category being MTM, minor tooth movement category. They don't have the technology to really compete. Uh, Of course, the second thing that Invisalign has that we talked about is the brand, the brand name, uh, the footprint, the global footprint. Uh, And so so there's a real differentiator. So I'd say that I'm a little more agnostic maybe since I left uh, Align Technology, but but right now our, our focus is really on uh, leveraging the relationship that we have with them, leveraging the brand and leveraging what ends up being really uh, the most cutting edge uh, solution out there from, a, from, a, from an aligner uh, perspective. Of course, you've got other, um, I know that um, there are other companies that are waiting for certain patents to expire uh, in 2017. And so the aligner market is already interesting, but I think it's about to get a lot more interesting. You know what I think is the bizarrest thing about Invisalign, though? What's that? Dentaltown has a quarter million dentists on there, and I've asked them a hundred times, why don't you put a course up on how to teach Invisalign, and they don't even return the email. I mean, I don't even get a reply, nothing. I mean, it's just, yeah. every time I've asked him, it's just crickets, and I'm like, yeah. how, do, how do you pass that up? Can I tell you why? Yeah. It's, it's among among many reasons, I'm sure, but really I think it comes down to 20 to 30% quarter over quarter growth, uh, you know, 20, uh, 75% profit margins. And, and that's, I think the reality, and I'm not just picking on them. I think that, that a lot of companies, a lot of organizations that, that are doing that well, I mean, who does 20 to 30% quarter over quarter growth, Howard? I mean, in, in the profession, certainly, in the profession, it's uh, it's quite limited. I think in business in general, there are still very few that are doing that well. And when you're doing that well, I think unfortunately, you don't really look, you know, at 
250,000 users on dental town. It, it, it becomes less important. Now, I think, and to the point of what we're talking about in terms of the changing dy- dynamic in the aligner market, that could very well change, you know, going into next year and in the next couple of years where the competition really, the, the dynamic of the competition really changes. Because while it's true, these these quote unquote competitors sit in a, in a different category of minor tooth movement versus the technology and, and everything else that, 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 that Invisalign has from the dentist perspective, do they see it that way? I don't think so. So, so they see it as, you know, aligner therapy, you know, they, they don't, they don't necessarily know the difference and a lot of instances don't really care. And they're looking at what the bottom line, if I can get what appears to be the same for a fraction of the cost, well, that's where I'm going. And we're seeing that trend. We're seeing that trend. We're seeing a lot of doctors go to the likes of ClearCorrect, for example. We're seeing doctors go to these other solutions, and you know, you, you kind of can't blame them. And so, I think it's an interesting dynamic at the corporate level uh, with Align. I think that um, they they should be, you know, reaching out to you. They should be engaging, you know, for for the next five years and for the next for what the next five and ten years might hold uh, for them. Well, they were, they were incredibly smart. They they spent all their marketing to the consumer. They yes. built up the, the name with the with the yep. seven and a half billion earthlings, and now they're yeah. coming in and saying, I want Nike, I want Adidas, I want Invisalign. And then that forces the, the provider to run and go learn how to fill that order. Yeah. You know I mean, so, so if everybody's selling spaghetti and you went out and marketed a billion dollars worth of, hey, order the lasagna, now yeah. every restaurant in town saying, hey, we need to make lasagna. So I, I think they were genius marketers. And now Absolutely. maybe the market's mature enough or they'll come back. and uh, um, Because well, the one thing they should uh, explain <coughs> is that they have superior technology. That They should explain that in their CE. So you have orthodontists on your technical team. We do. We do. We How have, many orthodontists do you have? Yeah, so we have four orthodontists. Uh, we have four general dentists. And... All of our uh, all of our clinicians have actually worked for Align Technology, so we're kind of like the band getting back together a little bit, and uh, they are phenomenal at what they do. And and what's what's great about them is they obviously are clinically trained, uh, but they're technically trained on the Invisalign ClinCheck treatment planning software. They are true true experts on the technical aspect that we do. In addition, there's kind of a third layer that a lot of uh, Invisalign doctors struggle with, and that is the communication aspect of their treatment plan with the technicians in, uh, in Costa Rica. And they're a fantastic uh, a group of, of technicians, and there are some clinicians down there as well. We work very closely with them, obviously, uh, in, in managing uh, these treatment plans on behalf of doctors. But there's that communication variable that can be challenging, but because our clinicians have worked closely or for a line and work closely with these technicians, that communication variable is is uh, is, is significantly d- diminished. And so we can accomplish things that treating doctors can't, again, because of those those three critical components, the clinical expertise, the technical expertise, and the ability to communicate those uh, to the technician and getting getting the ideal setup. So I would, I would love to podcast any of your orthodontists. I mean, you got four of them. Yeah, because um, Invisalign is when it comes to uh, orthodontics, Invisalign is the most requested uh, podcast and online CE. And we, we don't have a either really. And okay. um, and then second would be like six month smiles or six month braces or things like that. But uh, yeah, if you, if you got four orthodontists, I mean, I would do all four. I mean, uh, okay. and as okay. far as online CE, we'd love that, too. Have you been down to Costa Rica? I've been down there many times. It's uh, it's absolutely beautiful. The facility is incredible. Quite an operation down there, and um, it's it's a great place. Have you been down to Costa Rica? I, I've been waiting for an invitation for for ten years. I uh, I would love to go to. Okay. I, I'd love to go down there and uh, do a, do a story on it. Podcast down yeah. there. Glidewell's down there too. Yeah, yeah a couple so, of other. So what what is it? The two biggest dental companies. I mean, Glidewell is the largest dental lab in the world. Five percent of all the crowns in America are made by Jim Glidewell, um, and he's down there in a big way. And then Invisalign's down there. What do you think it is about Costa Rica as opposed to? you know, all their neighbors. Yeah, I know what it is. So what, what's interesting is they have a very interesting history. Um, what's what's I think most interesting about Costa Rica is that they uh, they don't have a military. So they literally have zero defense spending as a country. So 
what's important about that is what they actually do with what would otherwise be spent on defense. They, they invest it in, um, uh, in education. And they have, I think it's four or five dental schools in the small country of Costa Rica. And so they're turning out doctors all the time. Uh, and they have obviously a very, uh, a very um, good uh, dental technician uh, education system as well. They have the highest literacy rate per capita uh, in Costa Rica compared to, uh, well, certainly any country in, in, in Central South America, and they have a high level of English proficiency as well. So it's really the perfect place for any dental company, uh, whether it be Glidewell or Invisalign, and I think there are others. Uh, but those are the reasons why Costa Rica has been such a draw. And we've got uh, two of our orthodontists that are based in Costa Rica, uh, one of which is uh, one of our clinical uh, directors and one of our lead clinicians. Her name is uh, Dr. Adriana Garro, and she is incredible at what she does. In fact, uh, she would be thrilled uh, to do a podcast. I'm going to kind of volunteer her for that. Oh, that'd be amazing. But tell her I want to do it in person. Okay, I will. The Bizline's got to fly me and Ryan to Costa Rica. And we have to check out all the drinks that the, every drink that has an umbrella and a straw. I have to taste test. Then I'll tell you the Costa Rican drink I prefer. No, but seriously, I, I would love to go down there. I, I think that would be uh, uh, amazing. I mean, po- Costa Rica's got five million people, but see, I'm down here in Phoenix. Ten percent of all the homes flipped each year in Phoenix are Canadians. So yeah. you know they they want to get out of those winters and come down here. A lot of my Canadians. So you know, so ten percent of my practice are Canadians. And a lot of them um, eventually uh, also have a home even further south in Costa Rica. Yeah. And my God, they say there are so many Canadians down there that Costa Rica ought to rename itself Canada Part Two. Yeah. Um, did you notice a lot of Canadians down there? there? I know there are a lot of Canadians are down there. And, and, and tell me this, Howard, how nice are the Canadians? Oh, my God. Are they just like the nicest people on the planet or what? Well, do you know, do you know what the history of why they're nicer? You know, I don't. The actual history, this goes to show you how intense culture is. So when this crazy maniac named George Washington said he was going to attack the British Empire and go to war with the only empire who ruled 68 countries, about 10% of America said, you guys are nuts. I'm getting the hell out of here. And that caused a huge exodus towards Canada. So these are people that aren't crazy enough to declare war on an empire because they raised their taxes on a morning beverage tea when they didn't even drink tea and preferred coffee. And uh, so the Canadians going back a quarter of a millennium were more peaceful, pacifist, sweet. They're just nicer, nicer people. I mean, I grew up in Kansas and I remember my uncles getting mad when they passed laws that you couldn't booby trap your house. So if someone snuck into your house, you'd blow them in two with a 12 gauge shotgun they, well, they that sounds like should, Texas. Yeah, they, they thought like you Texas. should be able to kill someone to protect your personal property. That yeah. They would never even float that idea in Canada. <laughs> no, no. But there are a lot of them in Costa Rica. In fact, as it turns out, I think there are a lot of them in Cuba, too. Is there more Americans or Canadians retiring in Costa Rica? Because uh, America's got 10 times as many people as Canada. They got 30 million. We got 330 million. My guess, even with that stat, I would guess... I would guess that there are more Canadians in Costa Rica. Maybe and by small. And that's my my traveling uh, tip to all you guys. Like, uh, you know, the first of the year, my, uh, after Christmas, I got to go lecture in uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, then Cambodia. And my trick is that if anybody ever walks up to you with kind of a snared look and says, are you an American? You still say, no, I'm Canadian. Why? And they're like, oh, 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 sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I, and then they walk away. And you're like, okay. Yeah, I've experienced I that. I don't yeah. know what that guy was going to kill me over, but uh, I'm not going to find out. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, dude, I think you're the coolest dude. I am, um, again, if you're thinking about doing implants, find someone to hold your hand. Find a human. Don't go shop for the lowest price because when you shop for the lowest price, you're never going to get it done and you're not going to place the implants. And if you're thinking about doing Invisalign, my God, call Sheldon Crancher. Go to cleartps.com. You can email them, Sheldon, at cleartps.com. Are you going to give away your phone number? Because I actually got your phone number off the bathroom wall at the Circle K. So I, give would it out. Be, I would be happy to give my phone number out. What Absolutely. is it? It's 862 703 1031. That's 862 703 1031. 
and you're outside of Houston, Texas, in Friendswood, and that name really, because you're very friendly. You should be living in Friendswood. And remember, what are you going to give me for my birthday present? I'm going to give you a commitment for Dr. Amanda Canto to do a podcast on your show. I'm going to call her right now. And and your orthodontist buddy. From Costa Rica. Yes, and a second. So you got two podcasts uh, from from me. Absolutely, one hundred percent. And you know, you really, I will. I, if I was you, I'd build an online CE module because you because yeah. you got two distinct businesses. You got a clinical, and you got a um, you got a marketing. And what I believe in the marketing is that a lot of dentists sit there and, and you say, "Well, you want to learn in business line," and it's just it's they wear too many hats. They got to learn business and marketing and root canal. It's just one more thing. But say, well, will you just listen to this for an hour? And then for an hour, you show them how to do it. And then yeah. that opens. So you got to take them in steps. You just can't yeah. all of a sudden give them instructions on how to drive from Houston to Phoenix. Because they're like, well, why the hell do I want to go to Phoenix? Right. So right. give them an hour say, man, if you drove to Phoenix, look what you would see. And just an hour. Look, this is how you do Invisalign. I'm just going to show you an hour. It's not that hard. And then they say, okay. Okay, you open the door, you let some light in. Now I'm ready to go to a two-day course yeah. or, or join uh, cleartps.com or something. So, you know, incremental improvements. And, yeah. I, and that's why I'm doing these podcasts. I mean, I get it's, – it's an amazing because I get great guests like you. They're free. They're on their iPhone. They're, they're mul- the only reason they're listening to me is because I'm slightly less worse than the radio station on the way to work which is half noisy, screamy commercials and a bunch of sick songs. And they go, well, that sucks. And Howard is just slightly less suckier. <laughs> so I'll listen to Howard Dentistry Uncensored. And, uh, and I do this because in, in my 30 years, the dentist, the, all the cream that floated to the top only had one thing in common. They listened to about 100 hours of continuing education a year their whole career. They didn't walk out of dental school and say, oh, they didn't teach me everything. No, they yeah. they kept the dental school mentality their whole career, and that's yeah. why they floated to the top. And I think they need 100 hours a year, so I give them a daily show. I give them 364 hours a year, yeah. and if you just listen to every fourth show for free yeah. on your commute to work, yeah. your fat butt will eventually float to the top, and you'll crush it in dentistry. And a big Absolutely. part of that is for me to be able to get amazing guests on my show like you. Thank you so much it. for spending an hour with my homies today. Thank you for having me, Howard. I appreciate it. Hope okay. to come back. Okay, and if I don't get Amanda for Christmas, I'm I'm coming to Houston. I'll be I'll be looking for you.